Chapter 32 Race Riot Madness The skies were ominously dark with cloud cover and the ground was already dampened by a light rainfall as a collection of inmates started to file out onto B Yard at Pelican Bay State Prison. Each prisoner had to stop for a quick full body search before being released out into the general population mainline. 100 yards away in the maximum security shoe, Boxer Enriquez was taking an after breakfast nap on his cell bunk. It was like that every day, but February 23, 2000 wasn't going to be just like that every other day. Two Mexican Mafia henchmen, without the knowledge of Boxer and other carnales, had already guaranteed it. Two boneheads, laminate Boxer, sent out orders to kill as many black guys as possible. It was about 9.30 in the morning by the time the last of about 300 inmates took a place somewhere on the open field. Some of them were dressed in rain hats and body length yellow slickers because of a light drizzle in the air. A small group of black inmates stationed themselves at the parallel bars and chin up bar as a few pulled off a series of reps on the apparatus. A dozen or more sat at a couple picnic tables on the grass and several others stood at the yard perimeter trading stories. Groups of four or five walked around the track as a few jogged by themselves. On the concrete basketball court, black inmates played one-on-one -on -one as two teams of Mexican inmates, Sureños, staked out territory for a game on the other end. Sureños were forming in small groups across the yard, some standing in huddles, others plopped down on the tops of picnic tables by the dozen. Customarily, many of them spent their time on the foreyard playing soccer, but not on this day. There was something else on their agenda. It was a wet and chilly morning, but still, every single Mexican prisoner chose to go out on the yard. Not unprecedented, but unusual. Word was spread to act natural so the blacks wouldn't... He was doing 10 years for a robbery and was the shot caller on B-Yard as the leader of an MA governing board called the Mesa. Boxer explained, the Mesa was a selected group of four or five camaradas maybe one from each cell block that made collective decisions on how to run the mainline yards for La M. The Maceros replaced the Llavero keyholder system where just one camarada had total control to make decisions. Several years earlier, we eliminated the Llavero concept because it was causing conflict on the mainlines. More than one camarada was claiming the right to be the Llavero. The Mesa seemed to cut down on the abuses of the single boss notion and kept the drugs and other black market activities running smooth. A year earlier, a black inmate named Monster Blevins somehow had insulted or disrespected a sureño known as Panther or Panther. <sighs> One more time. Man. A year earlier, a black inmate named Monster Blevins somehow had insulted or disrespected a sureño known as Panther or Panther. It seems the M.A. Macero at the time approached the black shot caller on the yard and asked him to discipline Blevins for his disrespect. He refused. A snub to M.A. Sureño prison dominance, the stage was set for a massive retaliation. According to a criminal complaint, Clever Sanchez allegedly directed the manufacture and distribution of 30 new jailhouse shanks and gave orders to Sureños to kill as many blacks as possible. If you can kill a ninja, Clever told one associate, kill a ninja if you can. Boxer noted, there is a lot of racism in prison. Clever had allegedly laid the venomous groundwork for what would become the largest prison riot in Pelican Bay history. It's going to happen right now, Clever is alleged to have said at about 9.35 a.m. as he took a short stroll over to the side of the running track that reached around the perimeter of B Yard. He had already pulled his weapon from the hiding place in his rectum. Marble Simmons, a black inmate who was taking his morning run as he came around the corner and headed down the stretch. Clever lingered on the inside of the track, as one inmate would later describe it, like a tiger waiting behind the bushes for their prey to run by. There was an echo on the yard from the force of Clever's knife slapping the unsuspecting jogger's back. He grabbed on the victim's shirt to keep him from running away, but the larger Simmons managed to break free, stumble, and escape. The pre-planned riot was on. The entire yard erupted in what one inmate would later call madness. The blacks were caught by surprise. 
they were also heavily outnumbered as roving packs of armed sureños took them down and stabbed them over and over again. A repeated blast of commands came over the yard public address system, get down. The crazed inmates ignored the warning. Tear gas canisters rained down on the action within seconds of the initial outburst of violence, cutting visibility to zero in some spots. There were black men on their backs fending off blows with their bare hands as shafts of steel came at them like three or four driving pistons. The yard was painted with large white and gray clouds of gas and trickles of red blood soaking into the green grass. Puffs of dirt launched from the grass as guards started firing rubber bullets, then a half dozen warning shots with live ammunition. Back in the dungeon-like shoe area, Boxer recalled, I heard pod doors opening and the jingle of keys as guards scurried around ordering. Lockdown, modify program, go straight to your cells, don't stop at any doors. The small doggy walk recreation yards attached to the shoe had open air ceilings and Boxer caught a whiff of tear gas as the metal door opened to allow an exercising shoe prisoner back to his cell. On the main line, the constant hollering of hordes of sureños was deafening punctuated with the crack of mini-14 rifle fire from three correctional officers in the gun towers. The threat of gunfire seemed to have little effect. Clever had allegedly given orders to keep stabbing even if the guards started shooting live ammo into the yard. He said, if they started firing, keep pushing harder. Mostly they did. A sureño who does not want to be identified explained, there's no saying no. It could cost you your life. It could cost you getting hit, targeted. So, no is not an option. It's always you do or be done. That's the way it is. During the first four minutes of rioting, groups of attackers periodically stood down about three times, but within seconds were again on the attack. At one point, a surge of black power even drove the main force of Sureños back, but it lasted only about a half minute. Initially, there were only about a dozen correctional officers on the yard. They used pepper spray and batons to try to break up the skirmishes, but it did little good. Sergeant Hank Aiken said, your nerves come up. You don't know what's going on. You don't know whether you're going home. You don't know if you're going to get killed or not. A few inmates who returned from the shoe yard told Boxer that, in addition to the gunfire, they heard verbal commands, yard down, from the mainline public address system. I didn't know what or why, recalled Boxer, but I knew something serious was happening out there. Outside, fewer than a dozen blacks had their backs against the wall at one of the basketball courts. Outside, fewer than a dozen blacks had their backs against the wall at one end of the basketball court, as more than twice that many sureños cornered them, some swinging toothbrushes with razor blades mounted on the tips. One of the blacks was cold cocked by a sureño in the pack, and as he fell back, he was literally swarmed. The same gangster who had knocked him down kept on coming. There was the sound of gunfire and then the attacker fell to the pavement. The mob hesitated for a second and then took off running. 33-year-old Miguel Sanchez, a sureño known as Sharky, wasn't with them anymore. He was dead on the spot, a bullet hole in his head, a puddle of blood forming around his still body which was face up on the concrete basketball court, partially obscured in a fog of smoky tear gas. It was a death knell that brought the riot to a halt. Correctional officers pulled Sharky's body to the side and administered first aid, but it was too late. Unbelievably, Sureños around the yard were on their haunches, still ready to leap into action again. Four minutes after the fatal gunshot, there was another surge of Sureño violence, but it didn't last long. More than 100 guards had filtered out into the yard with armfuls of plastic handcuffs. Fortunately, there were 40 officers from another shift who just happened to be at Pelican Bay State Prison that day for training. Many officers had emptied their canisters of pepper spray. Under a haze of residual smoke, dozens of inmates were cuffed behind their backs and prone out on the ground. At the end of a quarter hour of rioting, one inmate was dead. 40 inmates were injured, most of them from stab wounds. 50 were wounded by gunfire. In the shoe, correctional officers now slapped boots on the cell doors, bars with a padlock and strap that jammed the door to keep it from opening. Why? Asked Boxer. The guard offered no reply. Later, officers reported 
that 24 live rounds were fired during the riot. Approximately a half dozen of them were warning shots. During the cleanup, guards found an unprecedented 89 prison-made weapons on the yard. In an article in the March-April issue of Peacemaker, the California Correctional Peace Officers Association magazine, Pelican Bay Chapter President Chuck Alexander said, It's unfortunate that one inmate died from gunfire. But had the officers not used lethal force to end the incident, how many more inmates would have been killed in the attacks? And if we would have just stood back and let them kill each other, we'd have been criticized for not doing anything. Boxer Enriquez and the upper echelon mafiosi were just as perplexed. Locked up in the nearby shoe section of the prison during the entire riot, they could only wonder, what was that all about and who called it? After all, doesn't Laeme run the yards? It turned out that the riot leader, Clever Chavez, had been corresponding via kites with Laeme's Alfie Sosa. The 57-year-old Sosa and his cellmate, 39-year-old Elalio Lalo Martinez, had given their blessing to the riot. The hot-tempered Alfie was a deadly snake possessed by legions of demons. Boxer believed that Alfie and Lalo were also bona fide racists, just hardcore racists. I don't know if they got beat up by blacks when they were kids, he said, but they are always just hell-bent on creating racial tension. A few weeks later, an unrepentant Alfie and Lalo owned up to their role in giving the go-ahead for the riot. Boxer said, Alfie, high on meth and doing push-ups in his cell, was laughing about it. It was pure arrogance not to forewarn the other carnales. Most of us disagreed with it because it ultimately prevented us from making money on the main line. It drew a lot of heat. In fact, CDC officials tightened prison controls after the riot. Normally, the general population was locked down only between the hours of 9 p.m. and 6 a.m. A new modified program had them locked down 23 hours a day for the next two years. This was no small thing, stressed Boxer Enriquez. And Alfie and Lalo left other carnales in the dark about it. It was the biggest riot in Pelican Bay State Prison history. However, as if the devil was looking out for his followers, the bloody and deadly riot launched an unintended consequence for mob opportunity. Boxer and the carnales closest to him were ready to take full advantage of it.